We actually just finished Luke in December, and, uh, and starting next week, we're going to start a new sermon series in Hebrews, and so we're going to take a quick pit stop in the book of Joshua today. We're only going to go through the first chapter, a piece of the first chapter, but we just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what's happening in this new year. But uh, so Hebrews will be starting next week, and we'll, we'll get diving into that, but we're so grateful. We, 2016, we, we had an awesome time going through, since I've been here at least, Ezra and Nehemiah, and uh, so now we're going to hit some of the, um, the New Testament. So um, this morning we're talking about being strong and courageous, and with that being said, I've, I've been paying attention a little bit to um, people talking about how they felt 2016 went. And there's a lot of mixed emotions, but a lot of people are kind of grateful that it's over. There are a lot of people that love 2016. There are a lot of people that share everything they felt about it. It's one of those things that they just uh, feel like we all need to know how things went, and so they give us every detail of how their year has gone, whether you asked for it or not. And 2016 is, is over with. Today, starting right now, actually starting at midnight, is the brand new year. And honestly, I was one of those kids in school that loved August because I felt like that was a clean slate and I could start over. Um, I was uh, one of those also students that liked the whole alphabet, um, not just A's and B's, um, but I wanted to get a plethora of grades going. And so the new year meant I could start over. And for some of us, that's exactly what we think of when the new year comes into play. Now, now, this is not necessarily a New Year's sermon, but today starts the New Year, so that's what we're going to talk about, right? Um, we all have resolutions, except for I actually don't do resolutions for one reason. I want to not feel bad when I don't keep them. And so I don't make New Year's resolutions. I'm going to try to do things better for sure, but if I start tomorrow on being healthy, by Thursday I'll be done with that. If I start next week, I'm going to go to the gym consistently and say that to people, by September, no, February, just kidding, not September, I'll be done with that. So if I don't say that at all and just put my mind to it, things are better off. And if you're like me at all, you understand. Um, but for those of you that can keep a resolution, I'm good for you. I'm glad you can do it, but that's not something I'm going to be doing. And so we're thinking about the new year, and regardless of how it went for you in 2016, I have a lot of friends that lost loved ones. Um, there's a family that we were close to that lost their two-year-old son. There's families that have lost moms and dads, right? We've been through a lot. People who've moved. Uh, we've came from South Carolina to Utah. Other people have made that transition. Some from all over the country. We've had friends who relationships ended and some started anew. There's a lot of positive and negatives that have happened all throughout the year. And the thing is, sometimes we're overwhelmed. And I don't know about you, I don't always know how to handle change. That's one of the beautiful things about us people is we don't handle change very well. Um, I can't see you, but I'm going to assume. How many of you handle change really well? Raise your hand. Okay, only the kids right here, yeah, because they don't know anything yet. I love you, but you got no idea, right? Change isn't fun unless it's like changing a new pair of shoes. That we can enjoy, but some people don't even like that. Change is so intimidating because it means we have to start things over, especially when you get older. That means everything has to begin anew, and all the work you've done up to that point has got to start over again. So if it's relationships, you've got to start from ground zero. If it's jobs, you've got to start day one. You've got to build up, and honestly, it intimidates us, especially when we don't have a support system that we understand. Now, if you are a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, there is hope in this because we can adapt to change, and God gives us clear instructions on how to do that, but if you're not, I feel, and I, my heart's burdened for those that don't know Jesus because they have no bearing to keep up with how they're going to transition. They don't have anything to encourage them along the way. Um, so we're going to talk about Joshua today in chapter 1, and I'm going to give you a little history. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and our sermon this morning is called Be Strong and Courageous. Now, a little foreground uh, understanding of this, where we're at in this story. Um, we all have heard this story before, but the God's people, the Israelites, are enslaved in Egypt. Now, I'm not talking about, like, it's just, like, a bad deal. Like, it's awful. They're, they're enslaved. It's a horrible idea, uh, situation, and God loves his people, and he wants to bring them out of that, so he sends his servant Moses, and we've all heard that story where Moses um, goes before Pharaoh, and they have this interaction back and forth, and eventually Moses leads God's people out of slavery, and they go through the wilderness, and in this process of leading them out of slavery, God continues to do amazing and miraculous things over and over again. 
just over and over again to show his people how much he's behind them and how much he's going to take care of them and be with them. But they continue to fall back into not trusting. They're like, okay, I appreciate that, God. Thanks for moving the sea out of our way, but I still don't know that you're going to be able to take care of us. And so the punishment for their disbelief and for them, they, they turned away from God and started worshiping other idols, is they were in the wilderness for 40 years before they could f- see the promised land that God said that they were going to have. So 40 years they're in the wilderness, wandering, um, just not knowing where they're going because they were disobedient and didn't understand. But they're getting to the point where they're about to head into the promised land and Moses passes away. So this is the point of the story right here. Where, where this happens, and Joshua, who was Moses' servant, is about to get the keys to the ministry. Moses is handing this over to him, and this is kind of where we take off. So I'm going to read. And if you have your Bibles and you can see them, if not, you can follow up here. Um, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, and to the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the um, going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This uh, piece of scripture right here should be absolutely the most encouraging thing you read. Because God is going to share something with you in this that can change not only 2017, but the rest of your time here on this planet. So we're talking about being strong and courageous, and the first thing we're going to talk about is transitions. We've all been there before. Some of us have started new jobs. We, I mentioned this earlier. Some of us new relationships. Some of us living new places. All kinds of transitions. And honestly, transitions are both exciting and exhilarating and terrifying and frightening. There's all the unknown that we are looking forward to, and then there's the unknown that we know we don't know if we can handle. So I want you to picture Joshua, who's been under Moses' lead for this whole time, and honestly, he's been Moses' right-hand man. Moses has been training him all along the way, teaching him, and Joshua knows the weight that was on Moses' shoulders, and all of a sudden now, it's given to him the responsibility to lead his people. It's a pretty big transition. It's a pretty big move, and I don't know that he's feeling this way, but I know how I would feel. I would be somewhat terrified of the responsibility. I would, I would be willing, but oh my goodness, is this huge. So Joshua is honored here. He's given this great responsibility, empowered by God directly. God is handing him the responsibility of leading, and as soon as Moses is dead, Joshua takes over the administration. Part of it is because Joshua was ordained in Moses' lifetime. Moses had already kind of been planning and preparing for Joshua to take on this role. And he was trained um, to be submissive and obedient by Moses. Now, this is a key ingredient in God using Joshua. I want you to understand this, too. One of the reasons why Joshua was called to lead God's people is because he was submissive and obedient. One of the reasons why we struggle to understand God's will is because we're disobedient and we're going to have it our way. I'm just being honest with you. That's the struggle that I've worked with my whole life. Every time things don't go well, part of it is because I choose not to be obedient to God's word, and I choose to want to do it myself, and I choose to want to take it on my own. But God's leaders, the ones that he needs to do his will, are the ones that absolutely are going to be submissive and obedient to his will. That is why Joshua was part of this equation. Moses knew that. Joshua knew that. 
the only way this works is if we're submissive to who, what God is calling us to be and what he's asked us to be. And you may ask the question, how do we know what God's calling and asking us to be? He gave it to us in his word. And we're going to get into this more. But Joshua was trained to be this way. Moses showed him, I want to teach my children to be submissive and obedient, not just to me, but to what God is calling. Now, part of why I say to me is because if they can also learn to be submissive to me, they can be submissive to God. I don't teach my kids to do things because I, it's fun. I'm like, oh, check this out, Jenny. We're going to make the kids clean. We just, it's going to be great. Now, they won't do it, but we're, we're they're going to, uh, she asked me one time to have them clean the bathroom. So I did that, and then she cleaned the bathroom when she got home because they just didn't pick that equation up. It's not their fault. They're, they're learning. But teaching them to be submissive and obedient, is it because I want them, I'm not on a power trip. <laughs> I might think that sometimes, but honestly, it's more if my children can learn to obey me, they can learn to obey what God is calling to them because that's the thing that I'm working for, is being obedient to him. Now, I'm not always good at it. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't a very submissive child. And I've learned why that, the ramifications of that. There's consequences to that. But um, Joshua is submissive and obedient, and it's key. So God needs those who are willing to follow more than those who want to just take the lead. The people who intimidate me the most are the ones that not just want to take the lead, but like love the power of it. Because the danger in that is they're not remembering or understanding where the power comes from. And I'm not talking about people who are stepping up when they need a leader. I'm those who just like, hey, I like being in charge. I, honestly, I don't want to be in charge, but if God's asking me and needing me to do it, I'll do it. The nice thing about the way we work in our office, I don't think any one of us bosses the other around. I mean, Bobby a little bit sometimes, but we, Daniel and I learned how to tune him out. Um, it's okay. We, we appreciate you, Bobby. But it's about those who are wanting to just do it because God's asked them to do it. Those are the people we want in place. And so Joshua is absolutely this guy in this transition. He's about to embark on the largest and massive undertaking of his life. And this transition is so much larger that one person could not possibly understand it on their own. God's plans are larger than we're able to grasp and honestly sometimes more intimidating than we're willing to admit. I think even... I'm just on a personal note, moving out here to Utah, honestly, it's been amazing and fun, but sometimes when I have to actually just be honest with myself, it has scared me to death sometimes, because we had a really nice thing set up in South Carolina. Not, I'm not saying that to you, but like, we were safe. It's comfortable. You know, our, our house was nice and warm. We were able to, we knew we could go back to it every day. And now we do the same thing here, but we didn't know that, right? We were coming out here. Now, I'm not saying that it makes us any more special than anyone else, but it scared us. I didn't tell a lot of people that, hey, how's the transition? Oh, it's awesome. That's what I tell people. It's been fantastic. I'm still nervous that the house hasn't sold. Now, I shouldn't be nervous, but that's a part of my inner uh, flesh, right? It scares me a little bit that we still have a mortgage in South Carolina. But God is so much bigger than this. His plans are so much larger that if I'm willing to be submissive to him, those details just become details. They're small. And most days, that's where they lay. But every now and then, I let it trip me up. And you all have situations similar to that. It may not be a home in South Carolina, but it may be something else. And those things overwhelm you, and you don't know what to do, and you're kind of scared. Honestly, the only thing you can do is lay at the feet of Jesus and allow him to provide so God's plans are larger than we understand. There was no direct route. Oh, in verse uh, 2, here, in verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, rise, go over this Jordan, you and all his people, this people, into the land that I am giving you to the people of Israel. First of all, the Jordan River was not just a little creek. Joshua also had to trust God that he was going to provide a way for them to get over there. He's going to provide a way. There's all these details of, that Joshua's sitting in front of that God's telling them, hey, it's going to happen, but you've got to step forward. Have you ever kind of psyched yourself out before? Like you knew if you did something, it was going to be good and healthy for your family and for yourself, but you're just too scared to make a move? That's been me before. I know things are good for me, but I'm too intimidated to actually do something about it. Now, I'm not saying that was him, but that's me oftentimes. In, the, in this story, what we see, you know, being strong and courageous, God gives us an understanding of what that means and how we're going to be able to overcome these fears. But life tends to do that to us because we honestly have such a menial grasp on what God actually is doing. 
In, in the scheme of all these things, I have no idea what his plans are for the rest of my life. And because of that, I get intimidated quickly. But God is saying, listen, transitions are going to come. Be strong and courageous. So Joshua and his guys are about to step over into the promised land. Which leads us to the second thing here is we have to re be reminded of God's covenant promises. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Now, if you at all have a sense of humor like I do, the first thing I picture in my mind is Mufasa sitting just talking to Simba. You know what I'm talking about? He's like, son, everything over here. And then there's all those memes that, yeah, that's what popped in my head. Now, God's um, so much better than that. I don't mean to demenialize, but that's what pops in my head. I'm human, right? I'm flesh. I'm just telling you. But it's kind of the idea. He's showing them. He's like, listen, everywhere you go, I'm giving to you. You trust and follow me. It's going to be yours. Why? Because I promised it to you. While the land had yet to be taken, the promise of it is just as vital as the gift itself. Even though it's not theirs yet, God had promised, and they need to live in that promise as if it's theirs already. Because God said it's going to be yours. So Joshua had to believe that that's exactly what was going to happen. Now, I'm also, I don't know that this is true either, but I believe that probably if it's like our setting now, there'd be people like, Joshua, are you sure that's what we're supposed to do? I mean, there's a lot of things going on over there. Are you sure that's what God said? And God said, listen, everywhere you step, the tread of your feet, I'm going to give that land to you. Because it was a promise I made to Moses, and it's one that I'm going to keep. He needed to believe that it was already their land. The promise that God made to Moses is that he will give the land as long as they keep his statutes. There's a lot of things that God tells us, you're obedient to me, and these things will happen. And we kind of get confused on what the word obedient means. But we're going to get into that in a minute. This was the only way God was going to let them be a part of this, is their obedience. Now, what I don't think obedience is, is blind just doing what people tell you, in terms of humans. Right? I let my very first ministry, one of the mistakes I made was I just blindly followed the leadership. I didn't ask questions, I didn't, I didn't do anything, I just did what I was told because I wanted to be a good leader, and I wanted, you know, the problem was the leadership may and probably could have done things differently. But I just blindly followed along. That's not what God's saying. Obedience is owed to him. Obedience is to his word. Because honestly, we're going to goof it up sometimes. Even people who love Jesus and are passionate are not always going to be on track. But God's word is where you stay true. God's word is where we stay connected. Sometimes I'm going to say things to you and you're like, ah, really? You, this is the source that you're going to come to. God's promise to be, if your obedience is going to provide is what he's talking about here. He reminds Joshua that now is the time for the promise to be fulfilled, and he's keeping his promise made. I picture, you know, God is revealing this to his people, and the ultimate promise is made that I will be with you. That's the part that this sermon really needs to, to settle in your heart. God's saying to Joshua, where you're going to go, don't stress because I am with you. Have you ever done something with your kids where they're intimidated, but you going changes that intimidation a little bit? Like if you, as dads, have you ever done something where your kids are like, I don't know that I could do it? And you're like, well, if a dad goes with you, will you go? Yeah, yeah. Right? Because they want that comfort of knowing that the, the strength in their life is going to be their support. If God's saying, listen, I'm not just going to send you out there on your own. If you're obedient to me, I am with you. He's making that promise clear to them. Look, I'm promising you that I'm not walking away. You know, one of the things that I've struggled with in my own life personally is people in relationships that have walked away from me. People that should love me that chose not to. I, I, I wrestle with that a lot, actually. Um, it's one of my, my thorns in my flesh that I have to constantly give over to God. But when I came to Christ, the beautiful part of that piece was him telling me, listen, you come to me, I will be with you. It's the only one that could ever promise me that. I love my wife more than anything, but I know that she can't promise me that she will always be with me. And I can't promise her that either. What I can promise her is that God will be with her, and God's going to be with me, and God's going to be with you. This is the promise that Joshua is hanging on to. 
we can be sure that the Lord is with us while we follow him. I think Joshua is getting this pep talk because God's wanting to set him straight up right away. This is going to be bigger than you understand, but I am going to be with you, which leads us to the guidelines of courage. He went through transitions. He reminds him of the promise. And in terms of being courageous and strong, there's guidelines for this courage. Verses 6 through 8 says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that it is written in it. For when you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. We're going to talk in a minute about what this success means here. But first of all, when I was uh, between my junior and senior year of high school in the summer, a gentleman named Glenn, who was kind of contracting some people out to renovate this building, hired me to do some work and to do some of the framing in this building. Now, I don't know a whole lot, but he's teaching me. But one of the requirements for my job was that he made me memorize Scripture. Yeah, he's like, okay, here's the deal. He, he worked for Youth for Christ. He said, here's the deal, Nick. Um, I'm going to hire you. This is what I'm going to pay you. Um, these are the hours. But every week, you're going to have to come back with me with this memorized if you want your paycheck. I'm like, okay. Now, first, the motivation was the money. But then, I'm telling you, the verse that has stunk with me in my heart the longest is one of the ones that he made me memorize. It, it's, it's just changed Everything for me of understanding, and it was this, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus answered, um, every man cannot live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. And I learned that I can't function without God's words healing and transforming and moving in me. I can't do it. I'm an eater. I like to eat. That's, that's clear. But, but bread alone is not enough for sustaining life. If you love and know Jesus, you cannot function just by living. Yes, your body will appreciate the water that you drink and the food that you eat, but you need the Word of God to sustain you. I'm not suggesting it's a good idea. I'm telling you it's vital. God's talking to Joshua about this right now. God knows the character of the people that Joshua is leading, right? He says, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land, because they honestly weren't going to do it on their own, because these people, every time they gave the opportunity, they turned to other things besides God. And God's trying to give Joshua courage, hey, be strong and courageous. These people aren't going to follow on their own. You're going to have to tell them, but you're going to have to do it from the word of God. You do that, I'm going to give you this land, you're going to inherit it. People, they wanted their own ways. Their very nature was to disobey. That's in us. It's our natural thing. When, when my children disobey, I get it because that's the way I'm wired. I'm trying to transform that in them, but I understand it. Yeah, I, I, I do the same. I don't like speed limits. I don't. Now, I try to obey them. I do my best, but it's not like I don't want to obey that. It's not in me to want to stay going 25 miles an hour. But I know that I need to for my safety I know that I need to for my children's safety, but we just don't always want the things that are good and right for us. We have to be willing to push ourselves to understand God's word is vital for us. It's not something that's natural to us. What's natural is disobeying God. That's in our nature. That's what's natural. When, we, um, when Adam and Eve allowed sin in our lives, it became who we are, and God came to redeem us and saying, Look, that doesn't have to be who you are, but if you want to overcome it, you cannot do it without this book. They were willful and discontented people. We often think about everything, but it's not often what God wants. I, my, my desires are not always God's desires. Mostly because we don't understand where to find what God wants. I've had that question. I don't understand. How do I know what God wants? Well, the thing is, here's the truth. You know, Bobby, you mentioned this. We're, we have this new reading plan coming up. I've got one right here. It's a daily reading plan, and it might seem trivial and meaningless to you. And it might be, seem something that, like, well, yeah, it's good to read the Bible every day for a year, but it doesn't matter. It absolutely matters. It matters so much that it will change everything about who you are and how you understand God. Because the thing is, when God's Word is cleansing you, 
it overcomes and overtakes a lot of the part of that natural disobedience that you have. Because God's word is true, God's word is honest, God's word is wholesome, and everything a part of me wants to rebel. But the more I'm in here, the more I'm understanding it, the more it's in my heart, the more I'm laying it down, the more I'm able to overcome. The guidelines for courage here is stick with the word. Joshua had to put the most valuable and precious thing he had in his heart in order to lead God's people. He didn't give him a sword. He didn't give him a gun. He didn't give him a staff that could do cool things. He said, my word is going to be the thing that guides you and these people into the promised land. Here's the thing. I know some of you are probably like me at times. We get overwhelmed. We get tired. We have kids. We're doing all kinds of things. And the last thing we want to do is spend time in the word because sometimes it's difficult. But the thing I don't understand, myself included in this, why we have the audacity to ask, God, I don't understand what you want from me when we never open up the place where the answer is found. That makes no sense to me. Like, Nick, why aren't you paying attention? God gave you the word. But, you're, you're, uh, man, this, this is so difficult. I don't understand. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I, I know he's my Lord and Savior. But, God, can you give me a sign? He gave you his word. He gave it to you. And I struggle with this, too, because I'm like, no, this is the place I find that. That peace, that passes understanding, comes from here. Now, there's so many things that are a mystery to us, so many things we're not going to understand, but there's so many things that we can use to guide us if we stuck to it. Strength and courage came from this book. For 2017, strength and courage for you is going to come from you diving into trying to understand this. Now, here's the deal. You're not going to walk away being a scholar. That's not the promise. And no one's asking you to walk away with a PhD in biblical literature. No, but what we're saying is, you want to be transformed, it starts here. If I want to be transformed, it starts here. There's no other promise other than you be courageous and strong by using my word. And God gives very specific instructions, right? He says, do not turn to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. He's saying, meditate on this thing. It should not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. So here's the deal. The priority for your life is not shoveling your driveway. It's not making sure you get all the groceries at the store before it's dark because you just don't want to go out. It's not making sure the kids have gotten their bath. Now you should bathe your kids. But the priority for your life it's got to be the Word of God. That needs to be what changes for you in 2017. You cannot expect anything else unless you are transformed by the Word of God. I'm telling you, that has got to be, and I guarantee you this, the more that you put this into your heart, the more you'll see notice the transition and the change. You will be able to be strong and courageous with whatever you overcome, whatever you encounter. That doesn't mean you're going to be successful in that, and then we're going to talk about success. What he's not meaning here is that, Joshua, if you read the Word of God and you meditate on it, and you obey all my commands, and I'm going to give you a really nice mansion in the promised land. That is bogus and garbage theology. The success is that he's saying, listen, what I promise is going to come true, and you're going to see my glory in all that happens. That's the success he's talking about. You're going to see me work in your people. You're going to see me do what I do best. That's what God is telling him. Success is that God's people are going to be in the promised land. It's not going to be that they're all going to have nice jobs with 401ks. It's not going to be that everyone's going to get along always and they're going to love each other. No, God's glory is going to be made much of. There's never a promise that success for you is that you get your mortgage paid off or that the more that you give to God, the more he gives to you. No, he already owned it. So the preachers out there that talk about, you know, if you give to God, he'll give to you twofold. No, he doesn't need to give you twofold. He owns it all anyway. He owned your half and his half. But what he is saying, if you want to be successful, you invest yourself into the word of God and you invest yourself in his kingdom, you're going to see and experience and witness the glory of God. And you're going to see it in the lives of the people around you. You're going to see it in the lives and the relationships that you keep. You're going to see God's glory made much of. That's the success that he's talking about with Joshua. We always think of success personally, but it's not about us. It's about him, and it's always about him. We come here and worship not because we want you guys to feel good singing. We want God to be glorified in all that he does. Daniel's heart in leading these songs is not for you. The reason why it's not a big deal that I can't see you is because it's not for you anyway. 
It's all for the glory of God. That's why we're doing this. That's why we come to this theater. That's why we worship with our children and do um, devotions at home, because we want them to see the glory of God in their lives. No other reason. This year with the Bible reading plan, I'm telling you, you will be amazed. Not so much necessarily that you'll see everything in your life um, change, but your perspective will. When you start thinking and looking through the lenses that God has given us, then things look differently than what they normally do. That's the guidelines for the courage that he's telling Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Verse 9, this is the best part. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. That is, I don't know what else can encourage you other than that. Wherever you go, when you go home with your family, doesn't mean every conversation you have is going to be sweet and glorious, but you're going to be able to do more for them by giving everything to God. He's going to, when he is with you, you can overcome anything. Relationships can be overcome. Um, situations can be overcome. Things happen. When God is with you, it changes everything. It changes your family lineage. It changes your children. What they need most from you first what, now, and this is something that is important for me to learn, too. Like, my kids need me to do uh, family devotions with them. They need me to do that. But what they need to see first is that it's a priority in my life first. They need to know that Jesus is the most important thing to me first, then their mom, then them. But Jesus is what's changed my life, because honestly, I can't expect them to understand and meet the Savior that I've met if they don't think that I've ever met him, if they don't even know that I know the guy, who the guy is. Who is God, Dad? I don't know. I've never seen you pray or talk to him. I've never seen you get in his word. I don't know that you understand him. That's got to be the priority first. And then I teach them who it is. Then I teach them how they can come to know him. Then I can teach them how they can understand him more. And when I, they ask me questions, where you know where we find the answers? We find them here. One of the things I've tried to do a long time ago is when people ask me questions I don't know the answer to, I try not to make up an answer. And I can make up a pretty good answer. You know those blue books in college that you had to fill out? Um, the essays. Yeah, I could fluff a whole thing of those. But I try to say to them, let me come back to you and I'll, I'll find an answer for you. Because honestly, I want to give people the, what the word says and not what I think maybe it said that I maybe remember. I mean, you know, we've gone to school. There's a lot of things I don't remember from school. That's why every day I have to be in the word and be renewed by it. The Lord is with you. You want to be strong and courageous, you do it with God by your side. That's the coolest part of this promise that we can have, is that God's saying to you in 2017 and in 2018 and 2019 and on and on and on, as long as you're on this planet, success in terms of seeing God's glory made much of on this earth comes when you make his word a priority and his promises he is not going to leave you. He is not going to send you into dark places on your own by yourself. He gives you weapons, right? He talks about this being the armor of God, comes from here. He's given you the strength to overcome. He's given you everything you need, but you've got to be willing and obedient to understand this. Now, there's so many things that some of us are like, I don't get it. Ask questions. There's so many things we didn't understand and still don't understand. Not only just us staff, there's people here in this, this church that have such a, a vast knowledge and understanding that know more than I do. Ask. I think the biggest detriment you can do to yourself is keep a question hidden. Ask. We want to see you understand that God is with you. So I'm not promising that following God's word will lead you to prosperity, because it won't. And I don't believe that that's ever going to be promised to you. I don't think anyone can promise you that. What I do know is that when you set his words upon your heart and you follow his words, you will see life differently, your perspective changes when you start seeing things through God's eyes, when you see problems as momentary discomforts in the walk towards eternity, it makes it kind of not a big deal. Yeah, there are discomforts. There are things that are troubling. Paul went through so many things that he didn't consider it a big deal. It's not that they weren't a big deal, but he knew what the outcome was. So yeah, he's in prison. Okay. But you know what the outcome is? God's glory. Sometimes our discomforts, though, are what God uses to accomplish his work. They become significant then. 
because they change us and they transform us and they teach us to trust and to fall and embrace. Not to say that we don't focus on overcoming them, but they don't have to define or regulate who we are. We don't have to stay in these places and we don't have to make them everything about who we are and who we were. Because when we know Jesus is our Lord and Savior, when we have come to a place where we've learned to trust him, anything that life throws at you becomes just a blip on the screen of eternity. Because honestly, once we get to spend the rest of our lives in glory with Jesus, that little discomfort you're not even going to remember. And on earthly standards, it may have been huge, but honestly, it's not going to be. There's so many things in my life I'm grateful for. So many things that I've done that I'm so thankful that they are just small little pieces of specks in the, of the life that God has given me. So if we want to see change and transformation, if we want to be strong and courageous as we enter in this new year, um, Joshua, um, if you look in chapter 3 real quick, he, he leads his people, and here's what the, he tells them. He's like, listen, the Ark of the Covenant, which is the presence of God, is going to walk past your tent. In chapter 3, he says this, as it walked past your tent, you get back in line, and wherever it goes, you're following behind it, I'm giving you that land. And this is what happens. God gives the promised land to the people. They had to fight for it, but they won the fights. God was with them. They had to do things to acquire, but it happened. And God kept his promise, and Joshua was strong and courageous. That didn't mean he wasn't nervous, but he was strong and courageous and trusted that God was going to be with them. And they saw the promised land. They saw it happen. We can understand and embrace God's glory when we follow his word and we're obedient it's the only thing that I can tell you is consistently true. God's word is never wrong. It's without error. It's infallible. And it's absolute. That's the only thing in your life that will be. So this new year, I want to encourage you to embrace it. To trust in God's word. As we look into Hebrews next week, as we go into whatever series we're going to do after that, on your own, I want you to be diving into understanding this. And if you're, you're like, I don't know much now, that's get into it more. The more and more you read it, the more you understand it. God's word changes your heart and your lives, and that's what we want for not only Redemption Church, but for the city of Ogden. The, city, the, the area that we're in to reach will get, be changed when the word is the priority to us, because the spirit of God in us will spill over on everyone else. And then we'll see it change outside of Ogden. We'll see the surrounding areas, and we'll see Salt Lake City, and we'll see everything happen when we are obedient to allowing God's word to transform who we are. And that's my encouragement for you and for me, for all of us. So this year, be strong and courageous. Take his word and make it a priority in your heart. And you'll see God do things in you that you never knew would happen because he's going to give you perspective differently and a mindset that you never had before. But God's word is the only way that that happens, and you can be transformed.